everybody. Hi. Hi. Welcome to our conversations on social issues. We'll be having these conversations every Thursday at noon, except for the week of Thanksgiving. And uh, my name is Kelly McHenry. I'm a librarian. And the library is offering these conversations on social issues because we think it's really important for there to be some form for the exchange of these kinds of ideas that is available to all the students here who can come at this time of the day. And um, if you have any ideas for issues that you would like to see explored, or you would like to give a, be a facilitator for something or get involved in this, I welcome your participation. Um, today I'm going to introduce Dr. Richard Curtis. He is an instructor of philosophy here at Seattle Central, and he has a, a background in in the philosophy of religion and theology. And so I'm really looking forward to what we're going to talk about today. And uh, please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think there's some, there's some useful concepts to start with. Let me make use of the blackboard. Um, the first, the first would be to act to to we can just, we can just ask, well, what is this religion thing? That, that's sort of the first question. Now, um, out out there, people seem to think that religion means believing in things you can't prove. But scientists and people who are trying to be scientific anyway have been studying religion and comparing different religions and looking at the historical development of religion for over 100 years now. And we've, we've come up with some, some different ways of looking at it. And one of the things we notice is some religions don't have this things you can't believe in element to them. In the Western world, that thing that you can't prove is called God. And in some Eastern <coughs> religions, there isn't a thing called God. But they're still religion. So why are they religion? Well, religion, religion is culture. But it's, it's a specific aspect of culture. It's the depth dimension. This is... Uh, from anthropology in the in the 1970s, especially the the I, I, I'm drawing on the, the work of a guy named Clifford Geertz. Um, so, re religion, therefore, is not something that people really choose or don't choose. It's actually something much more fundamental, and it's this depth dimension gets tied up in, in, in concepts we, we call <coughs> worldview. So the religion as a kind of culture is defining what's possible or not possible in the culture precisely because it has an understanding of how the world works. And this that part you will have noticed probably lots of religions have lots of ideas about how the way the, how the world works and and there are different other things have ideas about how the world works too what makes a, a worldview a religious one is that the world worldview is attached to ritual systems so if you have if you have a worldview and you have rituals you have religion. That's what religion is. Does that make sense? So this is the scholar, this is the scholarly view of religion that we've come up with over the last hundred years, trying to study religion. So, well, now we can notice that in in in, in a in a lot of modern cultures we have a phenomenon where we have lots we have different religions that are bumping up against each other. And then we have a whole bunch of people in, in, in Europe and the United States, especially, big percentages, 
who say they're not religious. Well, something about this view suggests that that way of thinking is mistaken. And the way that I, the way that I've come up with it to the, the a useful way to think of it is that is that this depth dimension functions like the operating system does for a computer. Your, your brain is, a, is, is in some demonstrably and significant ways a lot like a digital computer. Neurons are either firing or not firing in the way that the circuits of a computer are either on or off, corresponding to the ones and zeros that computers use. So the depth dimension here if you think of it this way, it's, it's limiting because of, because of the way it understands the world, but that understanding has been woven into a very deep level of how, at the, how, how thinking is done. And this, this view also comes out of Geertz, and he argues culture, um, it, the, the culture is the software your brain runs. So it must be the case, if, if on this view, that everyone has a religion. It might be because they are a modern secular person in a secular world and they don't, don't identify with it, any given historically existing religious tradition. They have a religion of one. But they're the only one who has that religion. But everyone must have the operating system. So everyone, and everyone has a worldview. Now not everyone has ritual, has, has sort of spelt out rituals, but we do discover that human beings love patterns. So even when we don't think of ourselves as being ritualistic, certainly you know, in the organized way that religions are organized about being ritualistic, we often are just in our own lives, in, in, in less significant ways that don't seem like they're that significant to us until they get disrupted. <laughs> and then we get a little bent out of shape. So I think it's helpful to, to, to keep this in mind, that talking about religion, we're actually talking about something that is, is very human. And because it's very human, it is the kind of thing that humans can have very deep and long-lasting disagreements about. And of course, a lot of the disagreements are about the worldview. Different religions argue about their worldview. And at that level, they are akin to the kind of disagreements individuals also have about worldviews, that we disagree about our worldviews amongst each other. Hopefully, it doesn't come to arms. That's when things go really horribly wrong, is when the worldviews come to arms, like something like the Crusades. People, there are people who want us to think that that's what's happening today, and I'm not entirely convinced that's true, although there's some elements of, of the fact that there is there are worldview clashes going on around us. But that, that's going to be something that, something that we can, if we get to, we'll talk about that a little bit. Okay, so having laid this out a little bit, I want to offer a way of understanding politics next. So pol politics sort of most fundamentally, and I'm going to do this graphically, politics most fundamentally it, uh, is, is disputes about power in, in society. And there's a, a language for talking about how to think about how power should be distributed that we've adopted from the French Revolution and that, that uses, uh, uses handed directions. And so we call this left. And we call this right. And this left view says that power should be diffuse. And so democracy is inherently a left-wing idea because democracy is about spreading, about the power being shared amongst the entire citizenry. Right-wing politics it is about concentrated power. And which, so by definition, right wing politics is more totalitarian, tends to be, tends towards the totalitarian, it doesn't have to be totalitarian, but tends towards the totalitarian because it's about concentrated power. 
But when we have political conversations in society, there's actually there's a whole lot more going on that's being um, disagreed about and negotiated than just how is power being shared. But this is the first level to understand that there is this disagreement about power. And democracy, as, as, as a left-wing political idea, is remarkably controversial in spite of the rhetoric it gets. So most democratic societies, democratic societies spend a lot of time trying to figure out how they're going to limit power, not how they're going to find ways of spreading the power. So think about the US, <coughs> US Constitution includes curious little features like this electoral college. We vote for electors to go to an electoral college. We don't vote for a president. I don't know if you all knew that. Why is that? Well, it's because the founding fathers wanted to have some protective mechanism between the people and real decision making, which was who's going to be in charge. And so they create this, this the, a body that, that can be created through a more elite power. So, um, and, and of course, it's over, the, over our own history in the United States, we've had social struggles over who's going to be counted as a citizen and who, gets, who has the right to vote. All of that is about how diffuse is power going to be. Okay, so the other, one of the other things that we, we, we talk about in, in, these, in, the, in these conversations it is really about something that's more um, cultural in the, in the um, ordinary sense. And this, we, we use the language uh, of conservative and liberal. So a given, a given society has a culture, and the culture is, 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 is an evolving thing. It, it changes over time. This is, all, this is always true, and in, in some sense necessarily true, I would argue. Well, people who are conservative in their thinking about social, these social issues, um, I should say that, social, social and cultural, um, they, what they want to do is they want to preserve old ways of doing things. The idea is well that, that we have a history of, of successfully navigating certain sorts of issues, certain sorts of decisions, and so we can look back at that historical repository of wisdom, and, and that should inform our presence. <coughs> and, and so the things that, so you know, you think, think about social issues, like a, a abortion or gay marriage or um, women's rights, um, all of those kinds of things, all of those kinds of social issues get negotiated between, well, do we want to, do we want to conserve the past or do we want to be sort of open to new possibilities? So the liberal is more, is more, more, more open, unconstrained. And so, in, so the political view of that is, well, the conservative says, well, the government should have rules that follow tradition and, and are, are enforcing tradition. And the liberal says, well, no, the, we don't need rules. I mean, it, it, people need to, be, need, need to be respectful and behave themselves, get along with each other in, in, in some legal sense. But the state doesn't need to worry about these kinds of questions. People should just figure that out for themselves. So that's, so that's the liberal position. We leave people to decide. The other thing, then, that gets <coughs> Uh, included is ha has has to do with economics, and so if I, if we we're going to graph this, we might think about this being the z-axis that's running through the room, which I have a hard time doing on a two-dimensional space. So I'm trying to represent a three-dimensional concept here, and this economic <coughs> one immediately I had green. Um, this economic one also uses the language of conservative and liberal, but I'm going to do something a little interesting and put conservative here and liberal here. And and the same the reason these words are used is because it's the same pattern that that in economics the liberal argues well no the, the state doesn't need to worry about navigating these things and setting rules managing the economy is what this is about where the economic conservative says 
Well, yes, the state should be involved in, in managing the economy. That's a vitally important role for, for, uh, for the state. So the, U the United States today, and indeed the, the Western world, is dominated by an economic philosophy that's called neoliberal in economics, which is, um, is hearkening back actually to, to the ideas uh, of someone named David Ricardo, uh, who's, who is a great systematizer in uh, economic thought. So, okay, let me, I'm gonna, let me just flesh this out for a second so this makes a little more sense to you all. Capitalist theory starts with this guy, Adam Smith. Well, the theory starts with this guy, Adam Smith. You all have heard of him? Yes? Yes. yes. Not necessarily. Okay, so there, in the, in the, 18, in the 18th, late 18th century, there's an English philosopher who's actually a moral philosopher by the name of Adam Smith. He writes a book called The Wealth of Nations in which he expresses the idea of a market used to exchange goods and services which is unbound by the government and is and, and, and instead is governed by the, an invisible hand. Now, Adam Smith was a, a very devout Calvinist, which is a form of, of Protestantism and Christianity, and he, he believed in, in, in predestination. So he, he to, to Smith, it is, it is God's hand that is the invisible hand guiding the market. But what's more interesting to notice about to note about Smith is that his understanding of, of what's happening with that market is radically different from this Ricardo character. Smith's idea was that the, all, the whole point of capitalism is that it's supposed to be a moral force. It's supposed to be, provide discipline for ordinary people in order to motivate them to be organized about their finances, to be more prudent, to be more conscientious, and, and to be better citizens. So the whole point for him was capitalism is a form of social engineering. It's going to create better citizens. Do you think well, that is a liberal thing? No, no, he doesn't. The, that, that, that it is God's hand rather than a human hand is sort of the liberal ver part of it, but that it is engineered is actually a fairly conservative idea. It is so, but, but to, to Smith, it was important that capitalism was providing moral guidance by, through a series of incentives. It's this guy Ricardo who comes up with the idea of free markets, sort of the idea that the government should not be involved in, in, the, in markets, that the market isn't supposed to be in so engineering human beings. Its role is not social engineering. It's not supposed to be a, 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 a vehicle for moral instruction. It's simply a vehicle for the exchange of goods and services. And so because it's just a vehicle for goods and services, Ricardo's gonna emphasize the, the, the role of free markets. Now that, so that's gonna be a radically liberal idea because there is no one managing anything. So it's liberal because it's, uh, the state is uninvolved. But what happens is, is that in 1929, capitalism collapses and there is this big depression and coming out of the, in the, in the 19, early 1930s, we get the work uh, of a, a new generation of economists led, led by um, um, John Maynard Keynes, who has been knighted, so it's now Sir John Maynard Keynes. <coughs> Keynes is the one who comes up with the idea, the ideas that are behind what's called the New Deal which was a very important part of, of how, the, how, how America especially got out of the depression of the 1930s. And, and that idea is that capitalism has these weird ups and downs. 
And those are a bad thing for society. They cause all kinds of disruption. And when they're really bad, they start they threaten the very fabric of society. And so the dep depression is the really bad one. And so, so Keynes argued, well, you can't let markets just, just be free because they're just going to create these cycles of, of recessions and then depressions. And that's just going to make a mess of the world. So what you need to do is you have, you have to manage the economy a little bit. And, and, and so government needs to adopt policies by which it can, it can slow down economic growth if it's going too fast, and it can stimulate economic growth when it's going too slow, as in a depression. And the, and the way the government does this is by taxing people who have money and, and then creating jobs for people who don't have jobs. And this is, this is called Keynesian, Keynesian economics. Economics. Now, this Keynesian model of economics is the way every government on earth works to some degree. They all have some sort of central bank that's managing flows of money. They are making it, the Treasury Department's making policies about how they're going to, what they're going to do about credit. Every, every economy on earth is Keynesian. Now, if you listen to politicians, you might not know that. But that's, tr but that's true. So what's, what, what in, 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 in the United States, what, what happens is, is, is an argument over how Keynesian to be. So the Republicans are partial to what's called military Keynesianism which means you use military spending as the primary vehicle, it's called a Keynesian pump, for pumping money into the economy. Where, where Democrats are, are, are traditionally more partial to social programs as Keynesian pumps. You build a highway system, and, and, and that, provides way, that provides jobs. Military spending provides jobs too. People have to build those things. What, what gets at issue is uh, the more you go away from Keynes, the more possible disruptions are. And so what happened in 2008 was uh, so much of the Keynesian policy that had been set up after the New Deal had been dismantled systematically since the 1940s that, they didn't, that we didn't have any of, the, any of the most basic Keynesian protections in place that, that, that would have prevented a, the, the housing collapse that we saw in 2008. Are you talking about like regulations of the banks? Of yeah, the yeah. So the and big can, one- Can I just interject for a second too? If you guys have questions as we go along, you know, please. Yeah. This is a conversation. Just, just, so. just ask. Yeah. <laughs> so, big, so this, this then is the, the sort of key question. Now there's these people called socialists mm -hmm. who, who come along with sort of this radically conservative idea that the state should take over the economy completely. That's what socialism is. But Keynesian economics is still a conservative view in economics because the state is managing the economy. And the issue is just how much managing it's doing. <coughs> All right, so when in polit so political conversations in any given society then are debates that involve all three of these poles. Now, what I would argue you need to understand to understand American politics today is, is that for the most part, there is universal agreement between the dominant parties, between, economic, between Democrats and Republicans, over the power pole, and the economic poll. And all and so what they disagree about is this. And that's scary because it means we're not talking about this. And we're not talking about this. So we're not making important decisions about how to respond to the world that might involve these elements. Which is risky because the model of the French Revolution tells us if you don't if you don't pay enough attention to those for a long enough period of time, eventually people get really annoyed and they start chopping people's heads off. So, so there's a certain point at which you have to start paying attention to these things. But for the most part, I would argue 
we don't, and that and that that's a that's a, a bizarrely American phenomenon of, of of the current age. There is an explanation for it, though. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll offer, but. Um, yeah, remarkably little disagreement here and here. All the disagreement is here. Can you be more clear about what it is they're disagreeing about in the uh, when you started putting your hands all over the board? And it's, as far as I mean, you're just talking about okay. Here, how how who who gets to vote? Sure. How who who gets to run for office? How are elections paid for? These are all these are all these kinds of issues. And the reason you're right there is because of how they're paid power. for, covering the economic portion of it. Also, because of, also because it's power. about power. No, that, that one all is about all about power. Okay. So power it, in the hands of is, few. Is it diffuse? As, as opposed I understand to that. I was wondering if there's any cross. I'm more wondering about the sections as broken up by lines. Are those? I mean, is there a crossover there? Is that, or are those totally unrelated? It's except where they intersect. No, no. The 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 the. the the, the graph is just re is just recognizing these things exist on continuums mm -hmm. um, that can be put into a relationship. Sure. Yeah. So, um, well, let me give you, let me give you a, let me give you a different sort of example. Uh, some some examples from history. So the the real extremes. So if you think about something like like fascism in Europe, Franco Spain or Nazi Germany or, or fascist Italy. What you have is the extreme of all three of these that have come together. And the s corporations have taken over running the state. That's actually Mussolini's definition of fascism. Corporations run the state. And the state is making all of its social decisions on the basis of tradition. So all of these have been collapsed. That's the, de that's the hallmark of fascism. What, what Lenin especially, and Marx, Marx doesn't talk quite as much about this kind of stuff, but what Lenin, Lenin had in mind for, 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 so, for socialism in, in the Soviet Union is that you collapse all of these three. So you get a radical democratic <coughs> polity, so as to spread out power, that democratic polity is controlling the state completely, that's socialism, and he happened to be very liberal socially. So he didn't think, he, Lenin, Lenin did not think that the state should worry about social issues like who was marrying who or whatever. Stalin very conservative, so that changes immediately when Lenin dies. But um, so so that's sort of the extreme is you have something like somebody like Lenin and somebody like 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 Franco. But there are weird ex weird other other examples that, that come out, and, and one of the one of the more interesting ones is someone like Gandhi. Gandhi is very left in his politics, so he, he's he's very he's a very very much a political radical. He was a socialist, so. He's in, in favor of a very, very conservative economic policy, but, he, but he's, he was actually very conservative on social issues, gender relations especially. It just doesn't stand out because we notice the other things about him, but he was actually very conservative on social issues. So he's, he's fairly extreme on these directions and this one, where he sort of collapsed them here. Most of what, so, so when, you hear, when you hear the language centrist, you know, a government is described as centrist, or a political party is described as centrist. It, this is the center they have in mind, or so center shift, right, right, or center left. So, if a left wing party, you know, is way over here, a center left party is here. Well, in America, our pol relative to Europe, our politics are really fair, are really here. They're center right, and, and, and Republicans tend to be on this side, and Democrats on this side. But they, they're fair, they're agreeing here, and our, the economics tend to be very liberal. And and here actually they bounce back and forth. Sometimes the Democrats will be over here, and sometimes they'll be over here. Depends on the issue. This one, of course, is the one where the obvious disagreements are maintained between the two parties. Where do you compare on that? Well, they're, they're, yeah, I mean, it's sort of going to depend when, where you have in mind and when, but Europeans generally tend to be more, more, more socially liberal than we are. But there's certainly places in Europe that are fairly conservative. And they're conservative parties. They want more conservative thought in, in Europe. The, 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 the best philosopher on social conservatism, just in case you guys want to look this up, is an English guy 
named Edmund Burke. Very, very, he was really interesting. He was actually, I think, probably the reason American philosophers liked him is because he was, he was a supportive of the American Revolution. <laughs> but, which is, you know, it's unusual for British, because he's, he's British, he's not an American, he was, he was English. Um, but, but very, very eloquent um, on, on, the, on the value of tradition in a very English way, you know, and so it's, it's not, it's, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, this sort of ranting extremist thing that you can find in France. <laughs> you know, you know, French are passionate people and the English are, are just sort of somber and stoic and they just sort of get by, right? So in his English way, he has very, very eloquent on, on, on the value of conservative um, social policy. Do you think this, so the idea is, number one, is that this should just be helpful to you in general to have in terms of thinking about politics. Okay, so. Something very weird, from my point of view, as someone who studies religion, happened in the early 1980s. And it seems a little like it was organized, which sounds kind of paranoid, but um, it's organized by different people in different places. It's not like a conspiracy. But, but there, was, there, was, there were a number of different people in different places in the, in the country who were who saw an opportunity in the 1980s to consolidate a different way of, of thinking about politics that differentiates our period from the 60s and 70s especially. And what happens first is the rise um, of an influ the increase of influence of, of a group that calls themselves neoconservative in the Republican Party. And this is, this is a term that people may have heard more recently because when, the, when Bush Jr. became president, it's, we started talking, we, they, they were talking more about this because the neoconservatives who were part of the Reagan administration came back in the second Bush administration. And, and so we get this resurgence of neoconservative thought in, in the political ideas that, that are sort of idiosyncratic to the Bush administration and its version of Republican politics. So, but this neoconservative thing has a longer history and it starts, it, it goes back actually to um, to, to the 1940s, to, to the, the work of a, a German emigre, a, sort of one of those people who left Nazi Germany named Leo Strauss. Um, so it has a long history, but it's not until the 1980s that neoconservatives as a group who have adopted a specific ideology that is, that, that is particularly right wing, extremely liberal and fairly conservative, some people call it an American form of fascism. Um, in the 1980s, these people are, are suddenly in the government again. And they've been all they've been in the university life since the 1940s, but all of a sudden they're in the government. So there's more public awareness of them af after the after that. Another question? Okay. So following along with this, there were there, there is the, the organization of a number of very well-funded foundations that were created in order to try and move the social conversation in a more conservative direction. And the way they did this was using um, Protestantism. And so we get the rise of something called the religious right. Um, so in, in the 1980s, and, and, and I'm, I'm not exactly sure why, but, but in, uh, in and around the city of Colorado Springs, south of Denver, these places start popping up like mushrooms. <laughs> they're just, they're all over. And where the money's coming from, not at all clear. 
Uh, and this is the period of time I was doing my first, my doing my master's degree. So, but all, they're all of a sudden there, and they and, and they have money, and and by virtue of the money, they they're able to have have influence, and so these, and it's not these these even these ideas go back to 19, to, to literally to nineteen to the early nineteen hundreds. They're um, associated with a. a one of, one of the early people who made a lot of money in oil using his money to publish uh, a book that lays out the origins of what we call fundamentalism in, Protestant, in Protestantism. And that happened, happened in like 1911. Mm -hmm. Is it the, the back, financial backing, do you, do you say in the 40s, isn't Ford, wasn't he a big part of that? The Ford Foundation and Ford, of the Ford Motor Company? Like, didn't, I think he went to Nazi Germany, was a fan. Ford, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, of, of yeah. that. And then yeah. I want to ask, the, um, you were talking about the, this goes further off, but the military pump, like that neoconservatism um, spreading, being pushed in politics in South America, in the Middle East, as far as having corporations in control and kind of putting a religion sometimes there as a uh, red herring. Do you see that? No? no? Well, using it. Uh, let me get there. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, well, then there's, there's like, I'm going there. I'm going there. So these, so these ideas have a history, and, and there is actually a curious pattern to, to them that shows up. Uh, it, 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 I've read, read a journalist identifies it with oil states. That, and, and what he, what he, he talked about is that you know if you look at look at the politics of Saudi Arabia, look at the politics of Texas, <laughs> or look at the politics uh, of um, Alberta in Canada. It what he notices is because those in this case, Nigeria. little 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 yeah Nigeria, Venezuela. those places have access to money, the state has access to money in a way that doesn't depend on the population. And so the state can get farther and farther removed from the people because it's not dependent upon them for money. It's dependent upon this oil revenue, which can be huge. So it means they can become weirdly detached and, and in some ways, well, it becomes can become a little totalitarian as well. Precisely because they're not having to hit people up for money. Anyway, so that's that seems to be a pattern with how religion and oil are fit, fitting together, and it's and it's we see it here because it was oil money that first did this. Um, but any rate, so Strauss seems to have picked up some weird lessons having watched the Nazis come to power, and rather than saying, "Oh, that's all totally wrong," he says, "No, that's what we ought to do here." So he starts teaching his, he's, he's, he teaches political philosophy, political theory. So he starts teaching his political science students, people in political science departments, a, a, a philosophy that they're calling neoconservative, which is neo in that it doesn't actually value the conservative, conservative social policy intrinsically. It values conservative social policy for utilitarian reasons. It's useful. So Strauss talks about something he, he, he calls uh, uh, pious, pious fraud. That religion, religion is 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 religion is is this lie that elite people tell the masses in order to control them. So he he didn't so so he so these neo, and this is the sort of interesting thing about the at least the intellectuals among the neoconservatives, so they're all atheists, but they're all running around preaching the gospels of, of the religious right because they think this is how you control the population. So there's a so there is this very significant marriage between these two ideas that happens when Strauss starts teaching these ideas in the 1940s, but. They they start, but they have they have power in the in society. I mean, all this 
this sort of stuff explains why it has power in, in academic life, why political scientists start to talk this way. Well, you know, university departments are depending a bit on, on, on who's going to donate some money. And, you know, they're going to they're gonna give a nod to, to wealthy interests. So, you know, we sort of, that, that's not so surprising. But what happened, this bit in the 1980s, is, is this bit with foundations. Um, spreading this way of thinking, which in essence is, is spreading, funda spreading a fundamentalist interpretation of Christianity, um, by using publishing houses, training programs for, for ministers, for lay people. So they just sort of, they, they're, they, they're using their financial resources in order to perpetuate one way of thinking about religion. And in the world, the same pattern seems to be showing up at the same, and are around the same time, but the vehicle for it is, is different. In, in Islam, the vehicle for it is a war in Afghanistan which is, it ha is used the same way. They, the, the, it's, it's portrayed in the Islamic world as if, it's, as if it's about Islam as opposed to being about the governance of a nation state. And lots and lots of money is being put into organizations that have a particular interpretation. And this is seen in Afghanistan on the ground in, in, the, in the fact that which, which groups among the what's called Mujahideen, who were the, the, the Islamic fighters in Afghanistan, which groups were getting support from the United States? Because not all of them did. The ones that got support from the United States were the most fanatical, the most fundamentalist of them. So the United States was, was picking out and nurturing, creating, some people would argue, creating the phenomenon of fundamentalist Islam in order that it could, could serve the same purpose internationally. That it's going to move the polity in a more conservative direction, which also is going to be tied to a more rightward direction. And that's going to lead to greater and greater concentrations of power. So the history, there is this history of the world you can draw from 1980 to the present that is the history of power being concentrated. And the, the, the mechanism that is used to justify the concentration, it, it is that it's all attached to people's sense of how the world's supposed to work. Yes? Could you say more about that, about the way people think about the world, how it's supposed to work? Well, that's, that's the point about religion providing these fundamental ideas about the nature of reality we'll call worldview. And so if you tie this, if you tie, so suddenly we get all of this talk about how economics and who's owning what needs to be tied to these worldviews where previously it had had really a variety of different connections. It had understood, Islam and Christianity both understand all of these questions in, in lots of different ways, depending on who you talk to and when you ask them, you know, which is to say what century you're asking. So, but it's, there's something, and, it's, and it, is, it's, it, is, it is right out of Strauss, this idea that you get at people's worldview by, and, and it is the worldview that identifies them with the system that they will now fight to protect, regardless of its actual character. And that's why the economic questions and the power questions can disappear from the conversation, from the political conversation, and we have, we have two parties that just maintain what I personally will argue is more theater than real politics, in which this becomes the subject matter of the theater. We're going to disagree about this. But in fact, these are the things that matter much more. And they're not taught, and since they don't talk about that, we don't talk about the things that matter much more, so we just have the theater over the stuff that doesn't matter as much. Now, indeed, these things can be vital, vitally important in individual lives, but in terms of the society as a whole, these two are much more important. Now, what I want you all to notice here, or at least one thing that's worth noticing about the way that I have portrayed this, and this is my, my personal analysis of all of this, and I can draw on a number of different scholars to, to, to demonstrate the reasonableness of this view, but this is my view, just so you know. Um, 
Where was I going with that? <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, I got a point. Oh, okay. So if you if you were just and I did this, if you were just gonna Google, because I thought, well, how what am I gonna talk about with, with in the, you know today? But if you just Google religion and politics, the thing that comes up over and over again is Marxist. At least in origins. And, it, in, and Marx has, you know, Marx, Marx has this line about religion is the opium of the people. And Marx actually has a much more sophisticated analysis than this implies. Um, he he's actually thinks about religion more in terms of its social role in a, in a much deeper way. But there, but I, but I noticed all kinds of people from all from all sorts of different political orientations. So, and so not just left wing radicals, but but even conservatives. Conservatives. This is what I found over and over again: is this religion just makes people feel better, and so when, when especially in a depression, people are going to be more religious because religion is comforting. Well, okay, that's true, but there's a lot more to say <laughs> about 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 what's going on with religion and politics. And it, I just found it fascinating, though, this, this one little idea from Marx has so permeated the world that when you, when you just sort of ask generally, which is sort of to ask Google generally, you know, you're, you're not getting expert opinions, you're just sort of getting opinions. But to ask Google for opinions, this just sort of pops up all over the place. Just, cause this is something conservatives have long hated, the idea that, that's, that, that you would even think of religion this way. But all of a sudden, that's the, what every political analyst like, was, was finding, at least on a cursory look. That's what they were talking about, is the role of religion in the election is about how, whether, how much it's opium or not. Well, there's a lot of dimensions of the role of religion in this particular election, because mm -hmm. we have one, one of the candidates is Mormon. And you know how does that play out? Um, I notice he's not really talking as much about religion as other candidates have in the past. We we don't see him in the tabernacle doing his rituals or like right. we have in previous elections. Yeah. Yeah. Say it's remarkably unreal. I mean, in previous elections, yeah, it's been like the forefront of all they talk about is this either about Christianity or it's not. I mean, that's it. And now all of a sudden it's jobs. Yeah. Yeah. But as far as policy and like the big arguments a lot of people are having about abortion and marriage and stuff, that's all really religious issues. So I think that's popping up a lot more because in the past it's, it's been about other things, and now people are getting more angry about even social right, issues marriage. are on the back burner. I mean, it's just not compared to. It seems to me compared to other other elections that abortion has been a much more important point than it seems to be right now. Yeah. I guess it depends on what, like, all the news sources you're looking at and stuff, obviously, sure. and, like, what you're Whoa. listening to, because I'm, I'm not arguing or anything, I'm saying, like, the, like, all of the sources that I read, like, I read, because me, personally, those are the things that I'm going to read, so it's popping out at me that, mm. um, these, this, um, election just seems, seems really, like, socially and culturally, um, religious. Um, right, but what's interesting is is you don't. They're not following the, the press is not following Romney in the church. Yeah, even even the last yeah. election they followed Obama. In the yeah, church. yeah, yeah. Now, and I think that is I think that is is precisely to do with the fact that he is Mormon, and the rest of the rest of the country is is getting reasonably comfortable with the fact that Mormons are around. But it's the belief the, the Mormon belief system is. Is compared to mainstream Christianity is still very exotic mm -hmm. and not at all fitting within the mainstream of Christianity. So that's awkward, and, and I think that's why you don't see. That's why they're they're taking taking cameras into church. It's not that they couldn't go the way they did with Obama or with Bush or anyone else. It's just it's his, his campaign knows this is awkward. I think if if it was reversed. I think that the right would have no problem highlighting the Mormon nature of a democratic 
not incumbent. It would have to be like a sort of reverse nature. Like if Kerry, for example, was Mormon, I think you'd see. Yeah, Republicans are, they are, are willing to be. Like they're, they're willing to also to be meaner in some ways. Yeah. yeah. We can't. It, that kind of goes right there to every point you made. If you're on the left, conservative and social issues to attack someone's religion is not okay. And from a neo-conservative standpoint, it it doesn't help to to display his religion, but it, but it's displayed in other ways as far as social programs. While well, you know all the economics and stuff is this big foggy. Yeah, layer and jobs, then distraction, the distra free, yeah. What they'll actually do is yeah. they're just recognizing a problem. Jobs are good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's as much. And, and it's because, and, 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 and I, you know, I think that's sort of obvious what's going on is they don't want to talk about Keynes. I mean, the obvious is, the answer is obvious. You have to follow the same pattern that Roosevelt used to get us out of the Depression. And, and, and it's just a matter of time. How bad is it going to get before they do that? But they're going to not talk about Keynes and not going to talk about Roosevelt. No mention of FDR at a convention. Uh, you know, most popular president in American history suddenly doesn't exist because that's they'd have to talk about Keynesian economics, and that means taxing rich people. Do you think there's a um, now in that there's some sort of kind of pushing to uh, making people look or try to focus on religious clashes? As well to take, you know, take the the view off of the economics and the power struggle to make them focus on smaller things well, that aren't as big as. Well, yeah. So you think about you know the this especially the way Bush talked about fighting a war in Afghanistan or Iraq, and he occasionally drifts off into sounding like he's a crusader. Um, <laughs> and then there's all this you know gibberish about 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 the character of Islam. There there really is some fundamental differences bet between Christianity and Islam and Judaism, which, which Islam and Judaism are m much closer to each other than either of them is to Christianity. Um, and, and what that has to do with is Judaism and, Christ and Islam both are worldly religions. They, are, they see themselves as aiming at creating a just political order in the world. And Christianity, very early on, becomes otherworldly. It's, it's talking about a justice that is restored in a different world. And so that, you know, so what you end up with is, is in the Islamic world, those countries weave Islam into the political discussions all the time because that's the nature of Islam. It originally was a political order, arguably. And Christ, but but in Christ, but but in our, we can we can avoid that in certain ways and, and talk more about no you know, rewards or otherwise and you know it's, religion isn't brought into the social justice conversation. That's interesting you say that because it's not it's frequently painted quite the opposite way. I think that especially when talking about Islamic extremism, it's pretty common for them to refer to it as oh they don't put a value on human life in the now and are more concerned of the fruits of the afterlife, but that is exactly what you just said about Christianity, but the, the right, yeah, yeah, that's what it's portrayed, but it's not, man, yeah, no, end, but it's just interesting yeah. that it's reversed in a way, yeah. that they're using it as like a social criticism of a religion that's actually identifying sort of more directly with their own, than mm -hmm. with the, uh, with mm -hmm. well, you all should know that it, the time is oh. up, and I, if you have a class that you need to get to, but I mean, there's so many issues here and so many things to unpack, and it's just a hugely complex topic. And uh, we have to have more discussions like this. And I really want to, uh, I really appreciate your coming and talking to us today and sharing My that. It was, that was very complex stuff to get out there in a, <laughs> on the board like that. You know, next week we, uh, we have um, Dr. Jawed Zawari coming. He's going to speak about the role of politics in the Middle East and the American election for president. So I hope you'll come back next Thursday. Tell your friends. Um, everybody's welcome. And um, again, if any of you are interested in working on this, we'd love to have your input. If you have ideas you want to share, please see me afterwards. Thanks so much. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you.